starlit night, thy King is born in Bethlehem. Our journey long, we see the light that leads to the hallowed manger ground. But fear we found in silent age for a hundred years. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to extend a special welcome to everyone here in person and also to those who are watching us online and later this week on YouTube. Um, we hope you enjoy today's service. It's our third Sunday of Advent, and we will be uh, waiting in joy will be our theme this day. Uh, there's no announcements this morning, so I would ask the praise team to start. Again. Could you stand with us in body or in spirit as we hear the call to worship? In this season of expectation, we prepare to welcome Christ Jesus, the Messiah, into the bustle of our lives and the hard-to-find moments of solitude 
we prepare to welcome Christ Jesus, the Messiah. Into our homes and situations, along with friends and families, we prepare to welcome Christ Jesus, the Messiah. Into our hearts and often those hidden parts of our lives, we prepare to welcome Christ Jesus, the Messiah. For beneath the surface of the Christmas story is an inescapable fact. Christ Jesus entered this world as vulnerable as any one of us in order to nail that vulnerability to the cross. Our fears, our insecurities, and our sins, all that can separate us from God, exchanged by your grace for love. We cannot comprehend the reasoning, only marvel that salvation comes to each one of us through a baby born in a stable, and it reaches out to a world in need. In this season of anticipation, we prepare to welcome Christ Jesus, the Messiah. morning and welcome. Brothers and sisters, here is your God. Among us in this celebration, he is like a shepherd feeding his flock, embracing us in his love, and bringing us mercy and consolation. May this God among us, the Lord Jesus, be always with you. Amen. Advent is a time of waiting. Advent is also a time of peace. As we wait, we are filled with joy, not because our lives are perfect, but because we don't have any struggles, but because we find our strength in the Lord, the God of our salvation. We are joyful because God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come into this world that we may be saved. Today, we light the candle of joy, and let us wait as people of joy.
Brothers and sisters, our Advent litany of confession is based on our text, Isaiah chapter 40. Sisters and brothers in the faith, we are not here to wallow in guilt, but we are here to make an honest confession. So let us bring that confession before our holy and merciful God and Father in a time of prayer. Let's go to him. O Holy One, we confess that we want to have more of you in our lives. Yet without the discipline and pain of preparing to receive you, Please forgive our evasions and cowardice. O Holy One, we confess that we get sucked in by those false prophets who offer us an easy discipleship and a cheap grace. Please forgive our desire for cheap substitutes. O Holy One of Israel, we confess that we even fool ourselves into believing that many of our rough ways and crooked paths are somehow justified. Please forgive our, excuse, our excuses and our defiance. In the name of Emmanuel, let us embrace grace, mercy, and peace. And all God's people say, Amen. Now this, brothers and sisters, is true love. Not our love for God, but God's love for for us. In Christ, we are a forgiven and a renewed people. Hallelujah. Let's sing of the Father's love together. Brothers and sisters, before we go to our God in prayer, just a couple of announcements and updates. We can extend our Christian condolences to Ruth and Klaus Vandermeer with the passing of Ruth's, Ruth's brother last week. Condolences go out to, to them. Also, Joanne Dunnewald is in hospital now with an infection, so we certainly want to lift her in prayer. Continue to pray for Ryan and his rehab at Parkwood. That's going well so far. We just pray that God would finish that good work that he started. Also, Klaus Vandermeer had his procedure. I don't think he's here today uh, on Friday, and that, that went well as well. And I think they're still waiting on some more results of, of that exploratory surgery, but we certainly pray that they'll figure out what's going on and then be able to treat him. Let's go to our God in prayer.
Around us, O oh God, the, the singing can be heard. We, we've just sung joy to the world to let heaven and nature sing. The season is to be one of hope that eases our minds when peace soothes our hearts, when love warms our souls, and when joy comes new every morning. But we are also aware of many who do not feel this joy. Some might try and others have given up trying altogether. Where is the joy for us, they ask. Our minds are not at ease. We wrestle with doubt. Our hearts are not at peace. There is too much to do. Our souls are not warmed. The chill of death is too troubling. Where, O oh God, can joy be found? We ask this as we come before you in intercessory prayer, opening ourselves to the possibility that hope, peace, joy, and love might still come to us. We pray for the lonely that they might find comfort in another's touch. We think of our widows in this church family as they celebrate another Christmas apart from their spouse. We pray for the oppressed that they might find relief from their heavy burdens. We pray for those wrestling with anxiety and depression that there will be times of light and peace and hope. We pray for those dealing with stress, that they might find the courage to let go of things beyond their control. We pray for the grief-stricken, that they might experience the newness of life that you bring. We especially remember Ruth and Veronica, who grieved the loss of brothers. And we think of Grace Haas as her grief is still so raw and painful. O oh Lord, comfort all those who mourn and bring about a peace that passes our human understanding and even joy in the middle of the suffering. May joy come to the world, O oh God. And may we grasp some of that. We do not pray for joy that is temporary or fleeting, but a joy that runs deep and sustains us even in moments of despair. We seek this joy in a season that can be less than joyful, O oh God. So hear our prayer. We lift up our sister Joanne in hospital, Lord. Continue to, to sustain her as you have in the past. We wait for Emmanuel, God with us, to come into our hearts once again. May we experience your love in new ways as we in turn love each other. We pray this in the name of the one who was and who is and who is to come. All God's people say, Amen. A reading from Isaiah 41 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, say, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim, proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed and her sin has been paid for, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for her all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. <clears throat> every valley shall be raised up and every mountain and hill made low. The ground shall become level and the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. All ma mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry out? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fail, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. 
The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and all his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers his lambs into his arms, and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This is the word of the Lord. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. A little low there. That song goes on to say he's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty or nice. He even sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. Now, is that song a comforting song, brothers and sisters? Or is it a scary, disconcerting kind of song? Well, I guess it depends if you think of yourself as good or bad, or at least more good than bad. If you're good, Santa's coming is a a joyful and a comforting thing. You might even get some nice presents from him when he arrives, even though his presence won't last long as he heads on back to the North Pole. But if you're bad, you'll probably get a lump of coal in your stocking. Brothers and sisters, a lump of coal in a stocking is the universal sign of a child being punished. In 16th century Holland, children would put their wooden shoes by their fireplace before Christmas. Good children would wake to find their shoes filled with cookies and candies, while bad children found coal. Now, if you believe Santa is only a myth, this song is simply a silly little tune. But could you imagine for a moment if your parent gave you a lump of coal on Christmas Day? This little girl in the video we are going to watch is about to find out what that is like. Hey, Jaden, grab that box and open it. This? No. This one right here. Right here. It's a dump of coal. How do you know? Open the top of it. Oh my gosh, it is cold, Jaden. You didn't get anything? You didn't get any presents? Yeah. Honey, it's okay. Now we can laugh at that little video because we know it was a practical joke. But for this little girl, in that moment, it was a horrible reality one that made her burst out into tears. So imagine if for years and years our Father, our covenant God, put coal in our stockings, in our wooden shoes. Wouldn't that be a cruel thing to do? Or what if our sins deserved it? 
Many will know this derogatory saying about people of Dutch descent, wooden shoes, wooden head, wouldn't listen. Well, that saying would certainly be true of most of God's covenant people in the time of Isaiah. They were naughty pretty much all of the time. They were a stubborn and stiff-necked people. According to the dictionary, to be stiff-necked is to be haughtily stubborn, tenaciously unwilling, or marked by tenacious unwillingness to yield. Notice the dictionary even uses the theological term unregenerate as a synonym. And if we look up the dictionary definition for unregenerate, we get this use in a sentence. The most unregenerate and irredeemable people you could ever imagine. The synonyms make that statement clear. Wicked, evil, iniquitous, sinful, nefarious, vile, foul, monstrous, shocking, and outrageous. Well, that's precisely the kind of covenant children God the Father was dealing with. Stiff necks, hard hearts, and full a foolish pride. Even after God sent prophets after prophets warning them to repent, they continued in their rebellion against a very good and loving God. A God who rescued their ancestors from slavery in Egypt and brought them through the wilderness into the promised land. It was in this promised land that God's covenant people were supposed to be good for goodness sake. For God's sake. For the sake of themselves and their neighbors. They even had God's good laws handed to them on a silver platter by Moses. They knew exactly what was required. To love God and neighbor. And if they were good for God's sake, things would go well for them. There would be peace and justice and flourishing in the land for all of its citizens, even the foreigners within their gates. But instead of being a light to the nations around them, They abandoned God and his laws and followed the wicked ways of those very nations, worshiping false gods and doing all sorts of naughty things. Things just like their in-the-dark Gentile neighbors who knew little to nothing about the God of Israel, the maker of heaven and earth. The God who was coming back to town, according to the prophet Isaiah. With this backdrop, it's kind of surprising to hear what we hear from God's own lips in Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. I don't get it. I'm confused. Not very long ago, I read through Isaiah for my personal devotions, and I found it a very difficult book. The first 39 chapters are filled with scenes of, and prophecies of judgment and judgment and punishment. And I didn't like it. Do you know Why? Because it forced me to remember my own past, my unregenerate, rebellious days. 
And sadly, it even reminded me of some current days where I found my neck stiffened again and my horn lifted up against my God, doing things my own way, not God's way. Maybe like me, you wrestle with God sometimes. But thankfully, we all lose those battles, don't we? As God graciously knocks some sense into those wooden heads of ours and softens our hearts that have started to become hard again. And then with limber necks and a little softer heart, we can bend low before our God, recognizing that we are like grass as verse 6 makes clear. And our faithfulness is as fleeting as the flowers of the field. And it's only from that humbled position, everyone, that you or I can receive some words of comfort from our Creator and our Redeemer. The one who reminds us of our covenant unfaithfulness and of his covenant love. It's only from a posture of humility that anyone can receive any comfort from Isaiah 40. And that, brothers and sisters, is where the Israelites found themselves after years and years in exile coal in their sandals. Coal that God delivered to the northern tribes through the mighty Assyrian war machine. And then God delivered a massive dump of coal, as the little girl Jaden in the video said, by sending in the Babylonians. The empire who destroyed every symbol of trust the Israelites were desperately clinging on to instead of their God. Jerusalem had fallen. The temple of the living God had been burned to the ground. The Davidic monarchy was finished. And a whole new cohort of Jews were exiled to Babylon. But that time of punishment and exile would end. It would not last forever. When God's word of judgment and punishment had been fulfilled, Israel would be then more than ready to hear the good news of comfort and joy. The news we hear, Isaiah 40. But before we dig more into this comforting text, I have to ask us modern day covenant people do you think a word of comfort might resonate with our contemporary world? It's hard to describe the atmosphere of gloom and foreboding that hangs over our world today. The pandemic has stricken millions of people worldwide and with new variants popping up, it's hard to see an end in sight. Then there are the the vast injustices in our world, the growing inequalities between the rich and the poor. Yes, I know there has always been injustice, wars, and rumors of wars. There have always been pandemics and plagues, fires, floods, famines, tornadoes, and earthquakes. They're nothing new to our contemporary society. But isn't the intensity of these things getting much greater? Brothers and sisters, the world was all worked up over the year 2000. 
But I wonder what might happen in this very decade which will mark 2,000 years after Jesus' death and resurrection from the dead, which was the very beginning of the new creation. Yes, the world could go on for millennia, but maybe this earth, this old earth is going through the pangs of childbirth described in Romans 8, where the contractions are getting closer and closer, stronger and stronger. God is coming to town. Jesus is coming back, and it might just be sooner than we think. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. But will that be an occasion for some hallelujahs? Or will it be an occasion to run and hide? I know I'm repeating this, but again, it all depends on your posture. It depends on your relationship with the God who is coming to town. If all the punishment and all the consequences of our sin and rebellion are making us realize how wrong we've been to stiffen our necks and harden our hearts, that's humility. And that's the only way God's message of comfort will bring us relief and joy. For the Israelites, whose God has been out of town for so long, it must have been very comforting to hear some good news from their God. A word of comfort, double comfort even. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. God is coming, not with coal, but with comfort. God is coming to comfort his exiled and humbled people. A people made ready to repent and to receive. To receive God's greatest gift of all, which has always been and always will be his presence. His life-giving life-sustaining, life-redeeming, life-restoring, forever presence. Advent and Christmas is all about presence, everyone. Not the temporary stuff that Santa brings and then takes off again to the North Pole. Advent and Christmas is about God's presence with us. In the flesh, it's about Emmanuel, God, with us. Which again is only good news if God does something about our stiff necks and our sin-hardened hearts. Because we know from reading the book of Leviticus that sinful people cannot live safely in the presence of of a holy God without something being done about the contaminating effects of sin and the separation that it causes. Well, according to verse 2, God says that Jerusalem's sin has been paid for. Your debt has been paid in full. Your sins have been completely forgiven. You don't have to live your life waiting for the other shoe to drop. Your punishment is completed. It is finished. Now to God's covenant people way back then, they must have wondered how God was going to forgive their sins. They didn't even have a temple. So there could be no atoning animal sacrifices. But we know something 
about that mysterious suffering servant that the rest of the book of Isaiah prophesies about, don't we? We know that in the fullness of time, God became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, the most humble person who ever lived. He was a God who came to serve, not to be served, to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was the sacrifice that would remove all sin. Can you see him, everyone? See? The sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. But in order for that reward to be given to his servants and his recompense, which is his payback, given to the rebels, Jesus Christ will have to do something to break the chains of sin and of death and of hell. And that something is what the suffering servant of Isaiah pointed to. Jesus suffered and died for goodness sake, for God's sake, and for the sake of everyone humbled enough to see, to believe, and to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior and King. You see, everyone's salvation has nothing to do with our goodness or our badness. Because we all fall short of God's goodness standard. Far short. But salvation has everything to do with Jesus' goodness. Because it would take a perfect human sacrifice to make things right between God and his people. And that's exactly, exactly what Jesus was and what he did. If you've never received him as your savior, do it now. For today is still the day of salvation. Receive the finished work of Jesus Christ, your substitute, your mediator, your savior, and your God. Do it today. From that cross, everyone, we heard the echoes of Isaiah chapter 40 when Jesus said, it is finished. Our sins have been paid for. Our debt has been paid in full. No more guilt. This is such comforting news for those who are experiencing a whole lot of discomfort in this world. And it's an encouraging reminder for all those who have already received Jesus as their Lord. It's our job now, brothers and sisters, to respond to the challenge that the entire book of Isaiah is all about. The theme of Isaiah is this. The Holy One of Israel challenges his people to respond appropriately to his presence among them. This Holy One of Israel is the title for God that, that occurs 26 times in this book and only six times in the rest of Scripture. The repetition of this key phrase shows Isaiah's deep concern that God's people respond to his holy, awesome presence in their midst in humble, reverent obedience. It's the only way to enjoy a rich and satisfying life. And Isaiah's concern is the very same 
for us today hasn't changed. We are to respond to the wonderful sacrifice of Jesus, which brings us into the holy presence of God with humble, reverent obedience. An obedience that responds gratefully to Jesus' call to love as he loved, to serve as he served. One way we can do that, brothers and sisters, is laid out for us in the passage, this passage of of Isaiah. Look at verses 3 and 4. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. Now, is Isaiah referring to the the many miles of desert between Babylon and Jerusalem? Or is this a way of talking about the bleakness of life in exile? Maybe it's both. But the point is that God is coming to you and you need to prepare the way for him. Many scholars see this as an allusion to the exodus in Israel's 40 years of wandering in the trackless wilderness of Sinai. In your second exodus then, make sure that the road on which God will come to you is a highway, straight and level and smooth. In other words, clear away any obstacles to God's return in your life. The gospel writers all see these words fulfilled in John the Baptist's stern call to repentance. We want to be ready when Jesus comes again because the first exodus took 40 years. The second will be immediate. Immediate. So how do we, Christ's humble servants, Prepare the way for his second coming. We do what the messengers of the good news did here in Isaiah. We go up on a high mountain. We lift our voices with a shout. We will not be afraid. And we will share with all those around us, here is your God. Jesus has won the victory He is Lord of lords. He is King of kings. We prepare the way for Jesus' coming by announcing his first coming and by living in a way that demonstrates his lordship in all of our lives. Later on in Isaiah, in chapters 56 and 58, The prophet shows us what servants of God look like. Unsurprisingly, they're the very things that characterize Jesus' life and ministry. They include things like doing what is right, loving and honoring God, opposing injustice, and providing food and shelter to those in need. Basically, the servant of God responds to the presence of God by doing those very things that mimic the love of God that we ourselves have received. And this will be the result, brothers and sisters. We will experience in our lives less and less the presence of our death-producing rebellious acts And more and more, the presence of our life-giving God. Wouldn't that be the best present? 
to offer our God? We don't do this alone either, by the way. None of us can actively wait for the Lord's return without some sort of strength and help. That's where the person of the Holy Spirit, of the living God, comes in. When we were born from above, we received the Spirit of the living God, the Comforter. The Spirit of Christ is present within us and empowers us, brothers and sisters, to respond. To respond to our King with grateful service. The Holy Spirit helps us to be good for goodness sake. So that the glory of God will be revealed. And all peoples will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What a glorious day that will be. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. We won't be pouting. We won't be crying. We will be all too busy singing hallelujah. 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 We are going to see the king. And all God's people say, amen. Let's pray. Lord God and Father, in such times as this, we again are amazed at your comfort. We are amazed at your grace and your mercy that you extended to your covenant people of old and you extend to your covenant people of today. Lord God, we have the advantage here of seeing the fullness of that grace and mercy in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our King. And even though we have yet to see him face to face, he has left us with his wonderful, powerful, encouraging comforter, the person of the Holy Spirit, who wants nothing more than to teach us and to remind us of all that you have commanded and to empower us and to enable us to live as servants of the living God, repenting of our rebellious ways. Lord God, we don't know when exactly you will return, but it is our prayer that millions, if not billions, of those who do not yet know you Will come to know you so that they too can be a part of that beautiful verse in Isaiah where all will see the glory of the Lord and be it may be a joyful and encouraging event not a fearful and terrifying one Lord Holy Spirit help us empower us lead us and guide us help us to be that light to the nations to those around us so that others too may come into the light that we enjoy. May they truly experience the joy of knowing you. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Brothers and sisters, we are privileged to partake of the Lord's Supper next Sunday, God willing. So we have a litany to prepare for that. Uh Uh-oh, I can't read that far. Mm. I've got to go up here. God created us as people with many senses. If we listen, we can hear God. If we open our eyes, we can see God. God is as close as the bread and cup we touch during communion. As we receive the gifts of the table, we taste the sweetness of God's love and are nourished by the strength of God's glory. As the aroma of fresh bread fills the air, let our words of praise and worship be lifted up to the Lord. Let us worship God with our heart, our strength, our spirit, and all our senses. Amen. And if you can read that, that's kind of small, we'll we'll read that together. Almighty God, before whom can be neither secret thought nor hidden deed, Grant us your spirit that we may know our hearts, our lives, and our inmost thoughts as you know them. Help us to examine our faith, hope, and love as we prepare to gather around your table next Sunday. And as we receive the gifts of your table, allow us to relish the smell and taste of new life, forgiveness, and grace. Let us be fully alive so that we may see, hear, touch, taste, and smell your presence and share your good news near and far. Grant us your grace that we may prepare the way by repenting sincerely of all sin. Find peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ and grow in assurance of salvation in him. May the celebration of our Savior's infinite love in his redeeming death bring joy to us and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our offerings as we, as we leave, brothers and sisters, is for the work of, our, the, work of the deacons and our church ministry's budget. Let's pray for that. Lord God, as we have been challenged by the prophet Isaiah and by your Holy Spirit to respond in humble, obedient, reverent service to you, we are so thankful for our deacons that are our representatives, our ambassadors to make, uh, be good stewards of, of all the offerings that we bring. Lord, to minister to those who are sick and needy, Lord, they are an extension of of the love that we give back to you, Lord. And we are so thankful for them. We pray a blessing on them and the work that they do on our behalf. Lord, we're so privileged to give not only to the work of our deacons, but to our church ministries and its budget, which allows us to to carry on the the good work of of standing standing on the mountaintops, proclaiming your good news. And Lord, uh, I might just be the pastor bringing that good news, but I represent all of these people. And together we bring this good news of, of encouraging uh, comfort and joy that uh, Jesus is Lord and King. 
And we do that together even as it goes out on YouTube and maybe people down the road will hear this years, years from now even. Lord, we just pray your spirit would go before us. That Isaiah said that your word would not return to you empty or void, but would accomplish the purposes that it was set out to do. And Lord, for us, we pray that that, that word will soften hardened hearts, bring about repentance and salvation and joy to many. We pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please stand in body or in spirit for the parting blessing. In this moment of worship, we embrace your presence again, O God, and we offer you our love. In this moment of prayer, we proclaim again your purpose for the world, O Savior, and we offer you our resources. In this moment of giving, we hear your call again, O Lord, and we offer you ourselves. Use us, all that we have and all that we are, to touch the world with the Christmas message. God is love. God is with us. God will never, ever leave us. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Our last song is the, uh, uh, a chorus that we're singing three times to the tune of the chorus of O Come All You Faithful. We'll praise his name forever is the first chorus. We'll give him all the glory and for he alone is worthy. <laughs>